I've got an F1 clutch here and in today's video I'm going to explain what it is, how it works and how a driver uses it at the start of an F1 race. The F1 clutch transmits drive from the engine to the gearbox before that drive goes through the diff and into the wheels and track to propel the car forward. It basically separates the engine from the drivetrain, allowing the engine to run but the car to stand still. The clutch then connects the engine to the drivetrain to allow the car to move forward from a standing start. In F1 the clutch is not used to change gear but only when the car pulls away, from the pit lane or at the start of a race and then again when it stops. Formula 1 clutches are only made by two manufacturers, AP Racing and Saks and they typically cost around £6,000 which is about $7,500. In terms of weight this clutch weighs just below 1.4 kg and has a clutch plate diameter of 115 millimeters. For context, the Ford Mondeo clutch is 5.2 kilograms and has a diameter of 240 millimeters. Newer F1 clutches are even smaller with a clutch plate diameter of 97 millimeters. Now, when the clutches are working on track and at the start of a race, the temperature of the plates can get up to 500 degrees. But what's really interesting here, as with the braking system and gearboxes that I've already gone over in this F1 engineering series, is that the mechanics of the clutch are actually very simple, which I'm going to show you in just a few moments. But first, where exactly is the clutch located on a Formula 1 car? Well, as you know, the Formula 1 car has a tub or monocoque where the driver sits. The engine is behind this and is bolted onto that monocoque. Beyond this, the gearbox is bolted to the engine and connected to that gearbox is the rear suspension. The clutch is situated on the back of the engine just in front of the gearbox as this is where it breaks the drive between the engine and the gears. So let's have a look at the parts of the F1 clutch. So here we have the front of the clutch. You can see um, we've got the basket here which is the yellow part. It's made out of titanium and it keeps all of the clutch plates inside. So if we take everything apart here I can show you how it's put together. So here we have the basket as I mentioned before, it's made out of titanium and on the inside here you can see the diaphragm spring. We're going to go into more detail about what this does and how it fits in with the whole clutch system a little bit later on. Then next up we have the shim and then we have the clutch plates. We have the driver clutch plate which are these ones with the fingers on the end. And then we have the driven clutch plates, which I'll explain why we have these names for these different plates a little bit later. So when you think about this clutch when it's connected to the engine, the basket here is connected to the flywheel on the back of the engine. So the, the bolts go through here and the basket is spinning around with the crankshaft of the engine. So here we have the slave cylinder. Now when the driver pulls the paddle, on the back of the steering wheel, the car's electronics understands where the paddle is positioned, goes through what is called a Moog valve, and that adds hydraulic pressure to this slave cylinder, which controls the clutch here. So when the driver pulls the clutch, the ring in the middle here actually moves out. It's a piston that moves out like this, and it moves out onto the diaphragm spring in the clutch basket just here. So the ring moves out and pushes on this spring. Now if you look very closely you can see that the fingers on this diaphragm spring are pointing slightly up and when these fingers are pushed on from the other side by the slave cylinder it actually opens up this ring on the inside here so it actually depresses this ring which means when all the clutch plates are in in the basket here, there's more space for the plates. So as I mentioned before, this basket is connected to the flywheel of the engine. And the internal part here, as you can see, will have a shaft that goes through to the gearbox. Now, when these plates are separate, we can have the engine turning the basket on the outside. And it is a little bit difficult for me to do, to hold everything together. 
but the basket on the outside can turn independently of the gearbox which is connected via this shaft here. So you can see that the engine can be running but the gearbox not turning. And that would be the case when the car is on the starting grid, not moving, but the engine is running. Then when the clutch is released, these fingers return to this position and the space in the clutch plates here is reduced, meaning that they grip together, taking that load from the engine through to the gearbox. With all the heat and load going through the clutch, the plates eventually will wear, meaning that the pressure and friction on the plates will reduce over time. Now, if I just take it apart here, I'll show you what is known as the shim at the front of the clutch. And when the plates don't grip together properly, this can lead to what is called clutch slip. And the drive doesn't go properly from the engine to the gearbox, meaning that the car will be slower and the clutch is slipping. When this happens, the clutch heats up very quickly and generally will destroy itself equally as fast. So with this in mind, the team will constantly check plate wear by measuring the stack. And th this is the stack that they measure. This will have to be a very precise size. But if you imagine when these plates begin to wear, obviously the stack height is going to get smaller and smaller. And therefore, so the team aren't constantly having to replace very expensive carbon plates here, they add in what is known as a shim. Now this shim is just basically a piece of titanium again that will have various different thicknesses. Obviously, as the plates wear, the thickness of the shim will need to get thicker and thicker so that it can take up the space of the wear. If you've made it this far through the video, I'd just like to take five seconds to ask you to subscribe to the Driver61 channel. I'm going to be working my way through our entire Formula One car, explaining how all of the bits work. So make sure you subscribe and click that bell icon. The most important job for the clutch is at the start of a race, when the driver needs to release the F1 clutch with a perfect feel to get the best possible start and potentially make up a few valuable positions. I spoke with F1 technical journalist Craig Scarborough for more insights on the F1 start process. Well, what you do have instead now is um, very much a procedure. So for the um, uh, first start, uh, a conventional start, they will go out, they'll have a certain number of burnouts they'll do, a certain number of practice starts they'll do. And their predictions means that that should bring the clutch temperature and the bite point to exactly where they're expecting it to be. Um, of course, there's always going to be some variability and that is just, you know, kind of the, uh, the jeopardy that you always get at a race start. Because again, because these are carbon fibre, just like the brakes, they can't be too cold, they can't be too hot, they've got to be at exactly the right working temperature. And again, because that will then affect, you know, the, uh, the stack of plates inside the clutch, the bite point will move slightly as well. So they want to arrive at the, at the start with that exactly where they're hoping it should be. And that's when the real difficult part for the driver starts, which is actually, you know, the, the steering wheel paddle procedure at the start and you know that's that's when the fun really starts in the past few years you although you can have two clutch paddles you can only actually use one of them for the start and that means that you have to find the bite point manually with your hand again there's no way that you can use a bite point find system um, in electronics and you can't kind of align the paddle with something else on the steering wheel which is what the drivers used to do they used to align the clutch paddle to the gear paddle and that would tell them where the bite point should be. You can't do that anymore. So now it's all very much from feel. And what they will do now is they will release the paddle halfway out at the beginning of the start. Again, as I said, control uh, any wheel spin, make sure the car is going the way they want, then release the second half of the paddle. You know, even when you do see drivers at the very top, you know, Lewis Hamilton is a classic example. Sometimes you'll have at the start of the season or with a change in the spec of the car will just not have the starts as good as he'd like and then he'll go away and he'll do some practice maybe i don't know he doesn't use the simulator quite as much he'll do some practice and he'll come back and then you know bang for the rest of the season absolutely spot on at every start at the moment the way the clutch paddle is if you can imagine the center of the steering wheel there the clutch hinge is about here and the paddle's over here so as you're moving that you get a very short paddle and as a result, if you can imagine you turn the steering wheel sideways, you get a really big arc as the paddle works. So as you're trying to move your fingers, your fingers are actually kind of stretching a little bit and that last bit of movement. So what Ferrari have done is with the steering wheel, the clutch pivot is about here. So you have a long paddle mm -hmm. to the driver's fingers. And again, when you turn it sideways, then the arc of your fingers of that paddle moving is much smaller. So, and this was Vettel originally. 
could actually get that last bit of movement, do just that little bit more on his fingertips rather than it trying to slide off of them and you're having to kind of manipulate your hand. Um, since then, Leclerc has taken that and we've noticed that Hamilton has as well, although Bottas, I noticed, tried it last year, but during testing, he went back to a twin paddle setup. If you enjoyed this video, please check out the short playlist that I've put together with all our F1 engineering videos. And if you'd like to find out more about Senna's really unusual driving technique, then check out this video here. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.